Hola, buenas tardes. Bienvenidos al Design Wednesday. Hoy estamos de Design Wednesday de vuelta de verano después del parón de agosto. Y nos hemos venido a la central de diseño como es una tradición reciente. El año anterior vinimos nosotros, hablamos sobre lo que hacíamos a, aquí a este mismo espacio, a la central de diseño, de espacio del que somos socios colaboradores y al que le estamos muy agradecidos por cedernos un día al año eh, esta maravillosa sala para hablar y compartir eh, de diseño. Este año es un evento muy especial porque mmm, de lo que nos vienen a hablar eh, Rebeca y Andrew de InVision es un tema que nos preocupa a todos los que trabajamos en el diseño, estoy seguro de que es qué tenemos que hacer para probar eh, el valor de nuestro trabajo, eh, cuál es el siguiente paso para, para demostrar que lo estamos haciendo bien, qué podemos conseguir. Y bueno, los que sois habituales, he hecho una cosa mal porque he empezado a hablar como si esto fuera un Design West Day de hace un año, y sabéis que ahora cada día presenta una persona del equipo diferente. Ya hacía mucho tiempo que no presentaba un Design Wednesday. ¿Y por qué presento este hoy? Para los que no me conocéis, soy Ancho, trabajo en el equipo de diseño de BBVA, me encargo de, de, de la estrategia de diseño eh, de, de, de los, del grupo y eh, de la comunidad de práctica de, de diseño dentro de la organización. Los que, me sabéis, los que me seguís mal a pista sabéis que hace bastante tiempo hice un Design Wednesday en el que hablaba de mi tesis doctoral, que era como, cuál es la situación del diseño en España. Y por eso hoy estoy presentando este, no porque vuelva a presentar los Design Wednesday, sino porque este era en plan, normalmente presentamos temas que nos interesan y a mí me interesa mucho lo que Rebeca y Andy nos vienen a contar, que es eh, cuál es el sentido del diseño dentro de las organizaciones. Eh, Espero que esto resulte, alguno, si os interesa el tema, eh, os podéis descargar el report, os lo haremos llegar por email, tenéis algunas copias impresas si quedan, que creo que ya no, por ahí, eh, para los que estéis muy interesados. Y además os anticipo que este evento es parte de una miniserie que vamos a tener este mes y el mes que viene con diferentes perspectivas. El mes que viene, aparte va a ser un... Os voy a, normalmente no adelantamos lo que pasa en los Design Wednesday, pero como creo que es bastante excepcional y merece una cierta organización eh, logística o sea, para muchos de vosotros, eh, también vamos a continuar hablando del valor del diseño. Hoy lo vamos a hacer desde el punto de vista de los equipos de diseño y de los diseñadores, a través de la gente de InVision que está fundada por diseñadores y que son más afines a nuestro trabajo. Y el mes que viene lo vamos a ver desde el punto de vista del negocio. Y eh, vendrá alguien de una consultora de negocio y lo haremos en nuestra sede corporativa, en la ciudad de BVA, en las tablas. Y muy interesante por dos cosas. Uno, eh, abriremos el, el auditorio al público en general, que no es un espacio en el que solamos organizar eventos eh, y mucho menos de diseño, se hacen eventos al público allí, pero no de diseño. Entonces, es una buena oportunidad, los que tengáis curiosidad de conocer cómo es le, la vela por dentro, pues para ir allí. Y, y hablaremos del mismo tema, ¿no? de cuál es el valor del diseño, pero desde la parte de vista de negocio. Hoy desde la parte de vista de diseño y en el próximo de eso. Esa es la miniserie y el adelanto. Para que os vayáis guardando la fecha de octubre, si os apetece ir a escuchar sobre esto en, en, en Ciudad BVA. Eh, breve funcionamiento de por qué hacemos esto. La idea es, es, o sea, estoy hablando en castellano. Ahora, cuando me pase el inglés, les daré la presentación y la charla será en inglés. La charla dura 40 minutos, luego hay preguntas, como ya os hemos comunicado en, el, en la invitación. Eh, tenemos un solo micrófono porque hay un problema técnico. Entonces, en paciencia con las preguntas, si tenéis algo que preguntar eh, y tenéis donde anotarlo, también lo agradecemos y veremos luego cómo gestionamos eh, si queréis hacer preguntas, porque va a ser costoso hacerlo así con un solo micrófono, pero lo gestionaremos bien. Eh, otro disclaimer, que no, o sea, normalmente cuando estamos en BVA, eh, 
no lo sabemos decir porque están nuestros compis de seguridad que tienen cuidado de nosotros, aquí por favor os pido que tengáis eh, cuidado, esto es matadero, es un espacio público, que tengáis cuidado con vuestras eh, pertenencias, eh, objetos de valor y demás, eh, porque bueno, eh, no nos hacemos responsables ni, ni la central de diseño se hace responsable. Sin más, dicho la duda logística, doy paso. I'm going to give you the talk to, to Rebecca and Andrew to introduce the, the, the report about the, the new design frontier. Thank you. Hey, how's it going? Uh, is this going to work? Yes, hello. Um, we'll do a brief intro. Um, my name's Andrew. Um, I am part of the design transformation team at InVision. Um, so I'm a practice lead. Uh, I joined from Lego, where I was a UX design manager there. Um, and so I go out now to our customers and I help them kind of level up on their design practice. So it might be, well, we're thinking about doing a design system. Um, so how do we go about that? So I might help them do that. Okay. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Rebecca. Um, I've been with Envision as a customer success manager now for uh, about three years. Um, originally from San Francisco, and I supported customers, mainly the Fortune 100 customers in that area, and mainly working with them just as they are trying to scale their design practices. So I was a support for them in some of the facilitating some of those practices, and then helping them with their tooling solutions. Um, I recently moved out to the UK, and uh, working with a lot of customers in the EMEA market today, so including BBVA. So very excited to be here. Cool, thanks. We've got one microphone, so we'll be <laughs> passing it back, so bear with us. Um, so today's talk um, is all around this idea of the new design frontier, which is a report that we uh, commissioned internally. Um, and what InVision has is a, a real benefit is to have access to all these customers, all these design teams that have, to a greater or lesser extent, used our tool. Um, but the, the kind of friends of Envision um, gives us access. This is kind of, yeah, it's like <laughs> gardening's going on in the background, so I hope you can hear me. Um, and it gives us access to various data points to in the industry and the community of design to interview and study the impact of the community of design altogether. Okay? So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through uh, the greatest hits, the, the highlights of the report. I see that a lot of you have got the, the physical copy. Uh, so this is kind of like uh, a really, yeah, the greatest hits of that report that you have in your hands. Sound cool? Um, I think the the kind of the 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 point of today really is to explore this com the the link between design and the value of design. Okay, so um, for a while now, we, I think over the last kind of five, ten years, design, especially when I first started out way back in 2003, design's matured uh, a hell of a lot to now encompass all kinds of different things like design operations, design systems. Uh, we have a seat at the table now within the business. Uh, design is valued as a differentiator. Uh, and really, the, today's talk is kind of looking at what that link looks like and how we can kind of start to qualify it for ourselves. Okay, um, so if I do that, oh, I'll go back one. Yeah. Transitions, watch out for that. Uh, good design is, is good for business. So the idea that um, if I have a mature uh, performing design practice, that ultimately contributes to the bottom line of the business as well as the customer experience. Okay, and the idea that we, all, we actually have data, we have proof of this now, that no longer it's subjective to say that we enter a boardroom and we have to kind of show our screen designs and justify the decisions and champion the voice of the customers. We actually have proof that this is a thing now, that design is good for business. So IBM is a famous brand, a big IT consultancy company, and they ran a really interesting report to try and understand the impact of their design transformation. So a few years ago, they hired uh, what felt like thousands of designers overnight, um, huge upscale in design practice. 
to try and understand what design could bring to the business as well as the design practice itself. So they commissioned a report from Forrester to understand what the impact economically uh, the design practice and the design skill and transformation had. Okay, so I'm going to run you through some kind of top highlights. The first one is the idea that um, there was a kind of decrease in the rework and the need for handover points because we're kind of involving all the different disciplines such as engineers in the role of design and the practice of design. That allows them to kind of get faster to market, right? To increase the productivity of roles that support design like engineers or have a part to play in the customer experience. Uh, that also then, if you have higher productivity, that then allows the, the business to come to market quicker because we're not necessarily worried about building the, right, uh, the wrong thing, we're building the right thing. Okay? And when we looked at the, uh, the, the financial savings at IBM for this kind of design transformation work, for a minor project, yes, that's substantial, but when you look at a major project because of the duration and the, the, the resource available to be put on that major project, that number is substantial. So they were able to essentially trace back the impact of hiring all these design professionals, the researchers, to understand what that looked like for the bottom line. Okay? So the story of now getting closer to the financial measurement of having a mature, robust design practice is kind of within our reach. Uh, and more recently, uh, McKinsey and, uh, Company, the big consultancy, they released this idea of a design maturity index um, report where it started to look at all the dimensions of high-performing design-driven companies and what that looked like for their practice and their marketplace. And here's some kind of highlights from that. So if we get down to the, the, the brass tacks, as they say, right, so the kind of revenue and the return of investment for shareholders of these companies, there was a significant kind of outperformance for the mature, high-scoring index design-led businesses versus the ones that necessarily didn't invest in design in the same way. Okay. And now they'll pass to Rebecca. Okay, so this is where the story starts to get interesting. So because we know that some design success stories aren't as successful as others, right? And we often hear about a story about IBM, for example, from a McKinsey report, but we don't really understand necessarily the steps or the why they were so much more successful. So Envision really wanted to understand that a little bit better. And with that, the New Frontier report was born. And we wanted to get a really clear understanding globally as to some of the things that would tie design practices back to business outcomes. So we studied. <laughs> we studied a lot. Um, we got a big sample size of 2,200 companies across 23 different industries in 70, oops, 77 different countries. <laughs> And we wanted to examine this through three different lenses of maturity. So the first being practices. So what are designers doing that's accelerating their design maturity more than other companies? People, so who is involved in the design process, maybe directly, indirectly, and then what's the frequency of that? And then the platforms that they're using. So whether it's design tools or operational tools that may be scaling design throughout the organization. And we asked a lot of different questions. <laughs> it went from different things from just general company information down to teams, sizes, what type of stakeholders were involved in companies, um, and then got a little bit into the nitty gritty about design process. So design operations. Um, are they thinking about design systems? Um, how far along in a design system might they be? So all of these different questions come up, along with people's behaviors. So when we're thinking about the behaviors of executives. How involved are they? What's their thinking around design? So all of these things start to come into play. And what we deducted and extracted from all of this piles and piles of data was really five different levels of design maturity. And we were able to really see some clear behaviors that really marked these different, these different levels out. 
but they also compound onto each other, right? Because if you're a level one and you're basically focused on more producing output, producing designs, but let's say you elevate to maybe you're up to a four and you're you know, perhaps being a little bit more experimental, trying to roll out some things that work at scale, you're seeing some results in the bottom line, you're also doing all of the other things that a producer does as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and just walk through some highlights from these different levels, and we're gonna start out at level one, of course. So as we go through this, you're gonna see this radial diagram, which is basically going to help us relate back all of the benefits to the three lenses of design that I just shared with you. Um, so for example, design strategy, you know, that's gonna be something that's gonna be significantly more design mature than maybe UI design, which is something that we practice every day. So when we look at producers, kind of basic, you know, we're very focused on screen design, we're very focused on pixels, and some of the activities that are going to go along with that are going to be very visually focused, interaction focused, we're prototyping, we're wireframing, and we're really just focusing on the output, you know, getting the um, product into the market. So your basic level of design. When we start to get into level two, we're obviously still doing level one, but we go a little bit further than that. You know, we're focusing on more so connecting different people. So not just the design team, but maybe different stakeholders within the organization. So we're thinking about things a little bit differently and who's affected and how we can be doing things just a little bit better. So some of the activities that we may be working on in the stages are perhaps some ad hoc workshops, um, maybe we're bringing in engineering to take a look at our designs a little bit earlier and iterate together. Maybe we're bringing in some executives to kind of take a look at what we're working on and get some approvals ahead of time. Um, ultimately, though, the benefits that we're seeing are higher customer satisfaction. So maybe some of the things that we're measuring in this case might be customer NPS, for example. And then moving on to level three. Level three is more focused on the infrastructure and operational pieces behind design. So while you have maybe a connector that is thinking about connecting different people within the organization, the architects are taking it that step further and thinking about how are we going to create an operational system that allows us to do what we do best at scale without having to think about all of the headache of the, of the infrastructure behind it. So some of the activities that you might see from the architect level, um, they're basically managing a lot of prioritizations coming downstream in design. Um, they're working on some documentation, some standardization. Um, they're thinking about design systems most, most likely. How are we gonna approach this? Maybe they're rolling some of those pieces out. Maybe they're testing that. And they're thinking about how they're working more so in a cross-functional team. So maybe doing daily stand-ups with a cross-functional team to understand how we can grow better together as a company. And the reported benefits that we see here when you're implementing more infrastructure and more organization is gonna be higher revenue, right? Because as you're taking some of the work off the plate of the designer, they're able to do what they do best, be more creative, solve some more problems versus figure out how to recreate the same the same uh, icon over and over again, perhaps. And I'll take you through the last two uh, levels. So level four, uh, the scientists, I think this is kind of uh, self-explanatory a little bit. So if you have ever been in the office, it's lunchtime, you're on Amazon, uh, you are shopping for something, and the friend, the colleague next door on the next desk is shopping on Amazon as well. Uh, and they've got a different button, or they might have a different layout of the product description page. Uh, that's because Amazon are obviously running a multivariant test, right? They're experimenting with you to find out what the, uh, the optimization there is for the user experience and the optimization for the, the conversion, right? So this is what level four companies kind of start to, to uh, get together and start to think about after operations, now that we've taken away all the headache and the time wasting of going off to too many meetings, uh, uh, getting pulled into too many interviews perhaps, and we start to give time back to the designers, they can then start to use the infrastructure of experimentation to really start to test and stress test in detail the user experience. So their focus is really kind of testing and learning. 
and prioritizing that in their work stream. Because sometimes if we are kind of level one producers, we are predominantly uh, focused on delivery, right, as the measure of success, outputs over outcomes, yeah, all that kind of stuff. So when it comes to level four, you start to then prioritize discovery. Yeah, you start to think, right, hypothesis-driven design. What does that look like? What am I thinking about impacting? And then how do I measure that as, we, as an experiment? So they'll be doing that kind of A-B testing. They'll also be doing concept testing. They might not necessarily put so much uh, effort or uh, attention to detail on the design. It's more about the provocative nature of a, of a concept uh, prototype. And they're also starting to get a lot more uh, critical about OKRs, objectives and key results, or KPIs, to try and attach to those experiments to see if they're successful. And then whatever works, then they scale out across multiple channels or d demographics. Uh, and this is where it starts to get really interesting, because if the, if the level three is about revenue and connecting people together and taking the headache away for designers so they can concentrate on the bottom line, the experimentation, the scientists of level four, they can start to then really enhance the productivity because we're building the right thing quicker than we would have done if we hadn't had that arm of experimentation, right? So level five, this is where it gets uh, super interesting, right? Because actually now we're we're getting the benefits of all the other levels, but now we can really start to think about what the future looks like. Uh, Andrew asked a really good uh, question today before uh, the talk about, well, what is the future of design? Like, what does that look like to you? And I think when you see level five, you'll see that actually we're bringing the business closer to the designer, and we're giving them access to things that perhaps they haven't had access to, such as the business model and the data that surrounds that business model so that actually we can start to concept what that future business might look like with our customers and use the designer's toolkit to really start to broaden the horizons for that market or even create a new market altogether. So if we look at the visionaries, they're of course going to get all the benefits of that radial diagram. But then they're also going to start to look at the strategy. So they're more strategy focused and more on the business side of things. Yes, we can make the user experience really awesome, but we can do so in a way that it benefits the business and the customer simultaneously, and then record and measure what that looks like. So things like trend spotting, so putting something out there to try and find out what the next big thing could be for the marketplace or so product market fit. And the idea about kind of connecting multi-channel strategy. So I don't know whether, like omni-channel is a phrase, right, in marketing. So the same message across different uh, domains and devices and channels, depending where the broader customer journey lives. That takes a lot of effort. And if we're just concentrating on one channel or one device, then the designer probably could be utilized across multiple versions of that. And when that happens, this is where it gets really exciting for businesses, because then design has an, uh, an opportunity to start to include other areas of the business to increase the share price, create new intellectual properties, new, new revenue streams altogether, um, or even start to bridge the gap between uh, parts of the business that predominantly haven't been touched by design. Um, if in the financial sector, compliance and legal is a, is a big thing, um, but actually bringing those people into the design to improve their workflows before it even comes to the designer's desk, right? So they're starting to look at those kind of opportunities. So, there you go. Not awkward at all. <laughs> so we had some key takeaways from this study that we can get conducted, right? Where design is really driving results. So what we found is that nearly three fourths of companies saw improved product design quality out of this report, out of design. And this isn't really news to you guys, right? For design, this is obvious. Um, I think the interesting thing here is more or less that, you know, design is aware of this, but other stakeholders in the organization are aware of this now. And this is becoming more the trend where we're focusing more as co and companies around design as a whole. High design maturity delivers outsized ROI. So, if we're looking at a level one company and we're comparing it against a level five company, what we're seeing, it's not just those little incremental changes. It is huge outsized improvements from their time to market of you know, an average of 6x to your valuation of 26x. So these are huge, huge benefits that we're finding. 
And what's interesting in this report is we were able to kind of see, examine some of maybe the myths and beliefs that we have around scaling design teams and, and building out these design practices. And we're able to, I guess, demystify or debunk, I guess, for, for lack of a better word. But one thing that we found in particular is what I've heard a lot of from my customers is that, you know, the, the need to scale their design teams or think about the structure of their design teams. And if they only were structured this way, their problems would be so much more improved. But what we found is actually there was no correlation there. And the size of the design team really didn't matter. What really mattered was their design practices and the way that they were scaling those practices across the organization. And we also took a look at, you know, some of the, I think, common belief that, you know, Bay Area Tech Central, that they have it all figured out, right? They know what they're doing. You're going to see fives across the board. Um, as somebody that's worked with those companies from Googles to Airbnbs to the Twitters um, and has now worked in EMEA with BBVA, um, very, very common challenges. <laughs> and it's interesting, you can see here that the comparison from the one to five range, it's almost identical. Um, when I speak with BVA about their challenges and all that they're doing across their design team, and I look at what I did with Google and listening to their stories about it, it's a lot of very similar, similar challenges that they're tackling. And so it's really interesting to, to be able to see that, but also to see it in the data, which is really exciting. So to kind of um, give you something to take away um, from today as well as the report, the report itself that you can uh, have in your hands and digitally download for free as well, it's very dense, but I want to give you the kind of four interesting things, uh, I guess from my perspective as a design professional as well, to say, right, well, these were the most compelling things to me and kind of tell you what those t uh, key takeaways look like. So. How do we level up? So if I'm kind of um, at level three, how do I get to a level four? So I'm going to give you the four things that were interesting to me, but also uh, probably talk to the level five organizations, OK? So the first one is that it seems obvious, but when I go into a customer and I consult on their design practice, 90% um, of the time, the conversation uh, kind of comes down to who you involve in the com conversation about what you're trying to get done as a designer. I think in the past, we've kind of sat down, broke out our favorite tool, and then designed something. And then shown it to people and expected them to believe in what we believe in, right? But actually, it's starting to make those tools and that way of thinking a little bit more inclusive and a little bit more accessible to non-designers. And actually, just having a conversation with the marketing lead on that particular work stream will do much more than the latest thing in design. Okay? It's a very simple premise of just talking to people. This idea of non-stop experimentation, that actually in today's marketplace, regardless of your domain, you really don't know what's going to happen in the next year or even the next six months. So your planning time is reduced, and you start to think about how you might actually experiment and hypothesize about what step to take rather than just predict and guess as you go. Uh, we become a lot more data-driven. Uh, I think this has become a bit of a buzzword, but it does actually mean qualitative as well as quantitative. So if we're doing non-stop experimentation, we're doing all the good practices of a user research practice, then we can start to understand what metric we should be affecting and push that needle forward. And then how do we start to bring design to the business and start to give them a seat at the table, but also then what do they say when they've actually got that seat at the table, right? Um, and why is that important? So let's look at these kind of four things in a little bit more detail. So when we looked at the report, one of the other things that we found was actually only a few benefit the most, right? You can see from the, uh, the kind of the map of the world that only a kind of a small fraction of the people in EMEA were kind of top level five. Um, and that is because when we looked at the things that we kind of look at as benefits for these levels, well, everybody now, really, we can build really usable, utilitarian products, right? We know how digital works a little bit better than perhaps 15 years ago. And we can start to build things quicker and faster than we ever have done before, right? But actually, when we start to go down and we look at the share price, the disconnect and the opportunity there is huge. So putting it another way, if we look at the levels in the split of the 2,200 companies that we did speak to in the interview and the surveys, 
and we start to look at the separation and the adoption of design, you can see partnering across disciplines is a key driver to that kind of level of maturity. So uh, if we kind of uh, uh, increase the adoption of design to other people other than designers, you're going to have a higher chance of being level five. But this is quite shocking to a lot of uh, design leaders. Well, there's a big gulf there, but I think this is the, the really interesting, awesome thing, and this is the rallying cry for you uh, uh, here in Madrid, is that's an opportunity, because there's so much more problems to solve for, so much more work to do, and so much more people to uh, get around the table and start including them in the design process. Because when you do start to bridge that gap, wonderful, amazing things happen, not just for the product and the customer, but for that kind of community within your business. So if we look at how somewhere like InVision, uh, which is kind of a tech first company, their kind of structure, or our structure should I say, I do work there still, uh, um, is kind of focused around this acronym of EDP, engineering, design, and product. Okay, so that is heavily influencing the, the structure of that part of the business, so the product, the platform that you use day to day, and also the decision making. Right, so the engineers are involved in discovery work. Uh, the prioritization is met with the idea that design leaders, engineering leaders, and product leaders come together and prioritize together and learn together. Okay, so when it gets downstream to then actually build the thing, everybody's on the same page and we can all start to rally around that and there's no question marks or ambiguity that could potentially harm our time to market because actually taking those roadblocks do, does increase pro productivity. So in the report, when we look at level five companies, the benefits of thinking like this and partnering across the business, you're starting to see huge, huge benefits, right? So the idea that they're more likely to uh, peers with their engineering counterpart rather than kind of a, a production assembly line, so the designer hands off to the engineer, then the engineer tries to build it and then comes back to the designer and there's something wrong with the design and all this rework that goes on, but actually partnering. And then the kind of idea that um, the business partners, the idea that the stake, this kind of mythical uh, name of a, a stakeholder is actually a, also a stakeholder in the design work and how do you include that through workshops and facilitation rather than doing the design yourself. So let's talk about experimentation, non-stop experimentation, the second point. So the level five companies are usually looking at some kind of funnel. Right, uh, so coming from uh, Lego, I was kind of the manager for uh, e-commerce, so how do uh, the parents and the gift givers actually buy Lego, and what does that look like? And when we used it, we used something like the, uh, the startup metrics, or the pirate metrics, because of the acronym, right? It's, our, it's a really bad joke, it's okay. Uh, and the idea is that when we run an experiment, we're looking at where the customer is on that funnel, and then trying to attach the design decision to one of those metrics. So we'll think, right, okay, well, if um, they're already aware of us and they're already signed up, then how can we get them to the revenue and start to run these micro experiments and this hypothesis-driven design to say, this is what we're gonna do, this is the outcome, and then this is how we're gonna measure that outcome. And not that it's an answer, but that it's a guess, and we can have the power and the infrastructure to actually measure that test. So if we look at the level five companies and we say, right, okay, they're nonstop experimenting. They're always looking to, I, I look at some of the experiments that I've seen out in the wild myself as a user. Uh, some of them are crazy. Um, so Netflix, for example, uh, they might have a link in the top right of their the kind of TV app that you're using on your smart TV. You'll click it uh, and then it'll take you through to a landing page that'll just say, thanks for your interest, coming soon. They probably don't have any intention of building that. It's just to measure if you're interested in, in it or not, okay? So this kind of behavior and this work stream then allows you to start to think about, well, that it decreases the time to market because we're taking those incremental iterative steps quicker rather than the big bang delivery. And then we'll actually start to, because we're being really um, conscious of how we measure those experiments, that's gonna help us re measure the revenue and actually how this impacts the business and the funnel that I showed you earlier. So when we start to think about uh, level five and they start to th think about how do we bring customers across uh, different touch points within the customer journey, this is another um, kind of uh, 
benefit and focus for level five design teams. So if you think about Netflix again, if you've ever watched um, a TV show or a movie on your smartphone and you've paused it, you've picked that same movie up at the, s the place you left it, that's the idea of that it's a continuous uh, user journey. So this is a framework taken from a uh, designer from Google um, from a book called Designing Multi-Device Experiences. I'll tweet that out so you can kind of have a look at it. And it's actually a really smart way how she's kind of conceptualized broader customer journeys across multiple touch points, right? So it might be that um, complementary is that uh, Envision is a completely remote company, right? We don't have an office anywhere. We all work from our homes. Uh, 900 people. IT security is pretty tough in that situation. So we have an app on our phone that is an encryption. We press a button and it unlocks the Google suite on our laptops, for instance. So there's a core device and then all the other devices are complementary, right? So there's a way to categorize how these co broader customers, more complex, multi-device, multi-touch points, multi-channel experiences work. And that's what level five teams are starting to look at. They're starting to look at how do we start to bring the design thinking into the call centers, the customer service, and bring those channels into that level of experience that we can get with a screen design product. And finally, when we do connect, so if we connect the, the business to the designer and the designer to the business of the level five companies, we see something really important, and that is this idea that the business becomes more resilient, more robust, to something called continuous uncertainty. So if I'm con constantly experimenting and I've removed all the headache for the designers and have designed systems, so I've got consistency, I'm building across digital channels, every, all the customers have a high satisfaction, the revenue's growing, I can now concentrate on what's next and the fact that every company, no matter how young or old, is in a constant state of continuous uncertainty, that they can always know that in a week's time somebody could launch a product that takes some of your market share and some of your customers. So having these habits of a level five company has that idea that you can deal with that with this continuous uncertainty. So I'll hand back. So we've talked a lot about these different levels and we've kind of summarized them into these buckets, but I think it's really important to remember that every company is extremely unique so while you may have, you know, level five practices happening within one area of your, of your organization, there could be another team that's down at a level two or three. And the real takeaway here is knowing, right? Takeaway is knowing and then understanding how you can then up-level other areas of the organization to better balance. So the, the full report is available at our site, which is designbetter.co. Um, we've talked really high level about some highlights of different, different stages, different levels, what you get at, at that point. But if you want to really get into the nitty gritty of the data and read up on that, you, it's in the booklets that you have, but also on our website, along with a lot of stories from customers just about their journey, um, which is really interesting to check out. Uh, and to wrap up, just before we get into some questions, uh, just to kind of recap what we've discussed discussed here, right? Um, the report is broad and detailed and dense, as Rebe uh, Rebecca said, that actually there's a lot more to it than what we've showed today. But actually, we've kind of covered designers a lot of different things. And when I'm out in the wild and we're kind of helping design uh, teams grow and get their practice sorted, these are the things that they kind of start to talk about is the fact that actually the, the design is kind of a utilitarian need that we build something that people need to use or meet a need, that basic kind of human need. But then we also look at the kind of producer's role and the aesthetics of design, the, the process itself, uh, strategy, design as business strategy, like what to build, how to build it, when to build it. Okay. Uh, we've talked about design as inclusivity, that really the design has to reflect what human, uh, the human race is today, and so the team is kind of starting to become more broader and inclusive about who it gets involved in that design practice. Uh, designers' leadership, uh, there's a kind of a, a convention or a, a stereotype that, or a cliche is the right word, I think, where desi all designers are leaders, but actually a business leader that can represent what design means to a business for a customer. And then designers' culture and designers' business. But really design today, what we spoke about, design is all of these things, uh, and this is what a level five 
team really thinks about. It's all of these things, not just the screen that you're designing for that day. So I'd love to hear uh, some questions, uh, but thank you very much for uh, kind of listening to my dulcet tones and uh, hope uh, that was interesting. Cheers. Hello, uh, well, my name is Freddy. Thank you so much. Thank you for devoting so much time and effort to do such a study and expanding our knowledge and understanding of design. Um, I would like to make you a, a question regarding like um, the, the study itself, not the beautiful insights and so on. Um, I mean, I must confess I'm a little bit like suspicious <laughs> when we do a study regarding the impact of design asking just to designers, no? What I mean with that is like uh, the design maturity is flawlessly depicted for us, but I've seen it like in the past, like we tend to be biased or, or excessively optimistic of our own work. I don't know if I'm getting understand to put a simile, kind of an extreme simile, it's like if we ask uh, police around the world around their positive impact, even the Hong Kong police is gonna be saying that it's positive. And they might be right, because they do their best, it's on their work and so on, but how can we objectively assess that there's a positive impact on reducing this time to market, time to share and so on, not just based on the silence? Yeah. Um, so it's a really good question. So the question, if I understand it correctly, is uh, how biased towards design was this study? Um, so when, I, so I use this model uh, as part of the design transformation team. Uh, so I do deep dive DMAs, design maturity assessments, using the model from the new design frontier report. And the people that I need to get involved in that project is not just designers. I need to speak to the people that are also indirectly uh, touching upon the design process. Okay, so that could be um, digital marketing, um, it could be engineering, um, it could be product. So we as a designer, I have design in my job title, so therefore I am a designer, but there are so many other people in the business that are also indirect designers, they might not know it, or it might be that design is actively facilitating their involvement, so that kind of cross partnership. Um, but when we spoke to the, cus uh, the customers that we did speak to, Yes, it could be a representative from de design leadership or it could be a representative from product as well. So it is balanced, it is obviously about design maturity, so we need to speak to the people that are practicing design every day to get a good read and a good understanding, otherwise a different, a different type of bias will happen or people will reach and start to make things up so that they get spoiled. Um, but if you're interested in how we actually did that, it was factor analysis, so we kind of collect everything and then when there's a clear behavioral difference, then that would define a new level rather than what people say. Okay, so it was much more focused on um, what people do rather than what they say they do, if that makes sense. Does that answer the question, maybe? Okay, yeah, uh, c catch me after, I'll be here all night, we can talk more about it, because that's a really interesting point. Uh, yeah. Hi, uh, thanks very much for the, for the presentation. Um, i like to thank you because I think this shows perfectly, you know, the value of a presentation, of a human communication, because I, I downloaded the, the report when I came out and I had read it and uh, it's completely, completely different, you know, um, take out, I take away when, uh, when you presented it to me, you know? And uh, my question goes through this idea of uh, the levels. Because uh, I just want you to ask you about if this level uh, organization at least is what the, um, the, is the image that it sends or this message it sends is like a one way path. So you have to go to, from level one to level two to level three. And uh, on the other side as well, I see like some connections on some levels that don't are straight, uh, straight away. You know? Like le level one, uh, the architect and the visioner maybe belong to a different part than the scientist and the. And the, the um, the connect on the, the other one. No? So it's really just a, a single path journey that you have to go through? Uh, 
yeah, it's a good question. So um, design is kind of represented in many different mediums today, right? Uh, one of which is infographics, right? And that the levels kind of suppose that it is linear, that I go from one to two to three to four. But to Re Rebecca's point um, about kind of companies being different, um, so I might interview, um, let's say they have multiple design squads, okay, and the kind of that matrix organizational structure. I might interview um, one squad or one chapter and they score really high. And then I'll go off and speak to another chapter and they're scoring medium. Okay, so there's a discrepancy there. And so what we'll do is we'll start to work on the best practices of the other team to try and level up the other team or even if they need to. Mm -hmm. So in reality, to your point, yes, it is more, much more like spaghetti. It's not a kind of a linear journey um, because organizational design is a huge factor in what the result of design maturity is and how those people talk to each other. So it could be that every company is unique, but within that, that company, each team, each designer is unique as well. Um, so it's really a tool to benchmark where you think you are and then maybe how you would leapfrog uh, the next level and you might practice parts of one level, parts of another, and then, yeah, it's kind of different for everybody. But this is just one representation of this. In reality, the spreadsheet or the kind of data set is just you could cut it any way you really would like to. It would derive the level, but it would also give you some kind of gap analysis as well, which is kind of the more non-linear journey. Uh, thanks. Thanks again for the presentation. Um, so you were saying that f uh, there are um, different um, amount of resources from different countries, uh, different companies, sorry, and there is no correlation between the number of designers and the level you are in. So my question is, what are those companies doing that are on level five, but yet like they have less resources or less number of designers? So I think a big factor there goes into how they're communicating and how they're collaborating together. Um, so regardless of resources, you can have a smaller design team uh, that are still inhabiting the right practices of, you know, proper design within their organization. They're communicating that with their cross-functional partners. I think that's kind of the point of that. Um, I'm not sure if you'd add anything to that, but. Yeah. Um, I guess that's kind of the, the point of um, architects, that level where one of the activities I sometimes get design teams to do is to uh, kind of, if, if you're a user researcher, you'll know the term diary studies or the technique of a diary study where you give somebody a, a journal and passively over time you'll get them to log some activity or some behavior and they'll write down what they did, where they were, who they were with, and then maybe after six weeks you'll collect those diaries up and then you'll analyze the data because then you'll understand where the context was when that happened. And I get them to do that and I get them to log the time that they spend not designing, right? So, and you'll be surprised about how much time people spend not designing, but they've got a design job title. So they might be in meetings, they might have to uh, get pulled into an interview at the last minute for a new candidate. Uh, there might be that um, the getting involved in marketing campaigns and roadshows, all kinds of different activities that don't attribute to actually building the better product for the customer and therefore the business. So if you look at design operations and the kind of rise of that role and what that means, that's essentially what that part of the business is trying to do. It's trying to take on board the budgeting, the project scope, the practices, the design system, uh, the recruitment, all the things that take time away from the designers and get them back to what they do best. So actually, if you were to do that, you could survive with a smaller team. Now we're saying that it's not correlated to design maturity, but if you are a big enterprise and you have a lot of different channels, then you probably need a lot of designers. That's probably the reason why you've hired a lot of designers because there's a lot of production work, there's a lot of thinking that have to go into that. But really, if you, even at that scale, you would have to get some kind of operations to give them the best chance of success for the, the business. So that's why those level fives can uh, operate with lower numbers of designers, 
but it's not correlated to the, the maturity anyway. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, and I'm not sure if my, my question makes sense, but um, whether the, all the companies that you've interviewed have the design teams within the company, and if not, whether you uh, came across any visionaries or any uh, companies that got to that level of maturity just by collaborating with design consultancies on a routine basis, and what's the best practice there to get to that point? Uh, good question. So the idea that um, what does an external resource look like for the design maturity? Um, yeah. So I think uh, the last four or five months I've been working with uh, a few partners in Envision to try and do exactly that um, with partnership programs and things like that to try and understand how if I do outsource my product design capabilities, what, how do I bring them closer into the business? And we've seen quite a few different models. Uh, so there's the, um, not the internal agency model, but the internal consultancy model, where design teams that are centralized, that have low numbers, essentially then go off and uh, secondment, where actually you hire a consultant and they set you up for success. They don't necessarily then go off and do the design work they train others. Um, the British government, um, believe it or not, uh, have one of the most mature uh, digital service uh, teams, I would say, in the world. Um, they have taught the White House, uh, Australian government as well. Uh, and the way they did it was to um, make it all very self-assessment focused. So um, if you think about the idea of a government where I've got to review my tax, I've got to renew the passport, um, they're different companies within a larger company. And so they act as kind of an external partner, but they're internal as well. And so they go in and the predominant thing is around assessment. If you're doing the right practices, you're doing the right things to talk to the user and often, then you'll pass, you'll get a certificate. But then we'll also train you on how to do user research yourself so you can hire a user research as well. So there's not one thing that we've seen. I think some agencies were involved in the... Um, um, the, the study, but it's only now that we're speaking to people like Frog and those big agencies where actually how do we use that model on them and it's been some really interesting conversations but I think there'll be another addition at some point in the future of the new Design Frontier report, there'll be the new new Design Frontier report uh, but it'll encompass more on the kind of agency relationship I think. Uh, hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, it was pretty awesome. Uh, I, w I was wondering about, um, in your opinion, what do you think the most effective way is to speak everyone's language that you're collaborating with interdisciplinarily? I think that's the word. Um, you know, being from very different backgrounds and having different mental structures. Yeah, that's a really great question because I feel like that's a huge problem that I see on a regular basis with all of my customers is really people just understanding where other people are coming from. Um, and I think a lot of that is attributed to the fact that for design in particular, there, it's probably not as likely that you went to business school or that you understand the background of an engineer completely or that you spend much time really watching what they do every day. And I think that is where you know getting involved more cross-functionally to really dive into some of those challenges and have sessions and workshops to better understand what people actually care about. Um, I think that goes across really any any type of job. What I do every day when I work with my partners is understanding, you know, how are you measured? You know, what do you care about? What are some of the frustrations within your day? And if you don't take the time to stop and think about that, you kind of do get lost in your own bubble. So it is something that we do recommend as a practice when we're working with customers. Like, getting in a room, getting everybody in a room, and just hearing their perspectives about what they care about, it really does shift your own and puts it in perspective of, oh, they took it this way, or that would have been frustrating if I'm just sending them this, this list of information with no context whatsoever. So I would say that that's the best practice for that situation. 
Yeah, and I'll kind of expand on that where, to Rebecca's point, you have the, the skill set um, as a designer to talk to people that you've never met before, your customers and your users, right? Uh, you sit in a lab all day and you talk to them and you test prototypes and you find out what works for them. Um, I would encourage you to take kind of Rebecca's advice and start to think about how you experiment internally about how you skill design and how you involve others. Sometimes it'll work, but it can be still hypothesis driven. Um, so sometimes I, it, at Lego, um, it was really easy to get the engineering team on board when I found out that all collected laptop stickers. Right, so then you just start giving laptop stickers out and then they start to talk to you. Oh, Andrew's pretty cool, he's got laptop stickers. I need a new laptop sticker. Um, whereas other times when I'm looking at more senior stakeholders like VPs, it could be that um, I try and get really good at pitching. So pitching is kind of an underused skill for a designer, I think. Uh, you get taught it if you've ever worked in an agency, but um, you really need to, yes, kind of, um, there was one team I remember that had built out a very well, design design system and a, and a shared design language. And it had a beautiful website, it had all the coded components, it was the Rolls Royce of design systems. Um, but his senior stakeholders just didn't fund it. They didn't want to do it. It was a side project. It was He was using his own time to do it. Um, and he'd calculated, um, he'd used a spreadsheet to essentially calculate the design debt of his design language across all the different websites that he managed. And it had a substantial number. It was quite intimidating how much debt this company has. Um, and the fact that that ultimately has to be paid off eventually with either a massive redesign or iterative refactoring. Um, I told him to, instead of doing that, I said just print out the entire uh, website on paper and look for all the inconsistencies and all the duplication and then just stick that on a wall somewhere public in the office and then just see what happens. Um, and sure enough, his leaders came up, saw all the mess on the wall, and then he then got backing for a full-funded design system. And the reason why is that you've got the fact of the debt, right, the number, but then you've also got the emotional side of a pitch, that you've actually started to speak something in their language or something that speaks better or differently to the audience. But to Rebecca's point, it's, it's again, constant experimentation. Um, at Envision, I get to work with all different partners from sales to technology to product to the design itself, even research or customer service and uh, support. Um, but that is then giving me the language through experience of being able to talk to these people in future jobs. So I would, I would encourage you to diversify who you start to include and who you talk to. Last question. Hi. Um, you said that three quarters of all the enterprise, um, they see or, or they saw um, um, they increased the product quality, right? What happened with the rest? <laughs> so what happened to the rest? Yeah, cool. So a good question. Uh, straight, I like it. Um, so what that kind of insight is saying is that um, the designers, leaders, right, the people that ultimately hire the designers, appreciate that there is some value and some quality attached to having a lot of designers around the building and practicing design well. Okay, um, They might not necessarily know how to fully understand what that value is, but other than the quality of the product is increased. What happened to the other, they just didn't answer that question that would uh, infer that behavior. It's, it's simple to put, they just didn't answer the, the, with the right answer. Um, so there's lots of, with factor analysis and the, the way the questions are structured, it's essentially saying, well, tell me when you did this. It's like a job interview, tell me when you did that, tell me when you did that. And if they didn't do something, then that would be rolled up quantitatively into a model that essentially then derives your level if that makes sense. So yeah, they just didn't see the quality <laughs> in, a, in a simple way. Thank you so much. Thank you, big applause, last one.
Thank you. We can keep the conversation where we have a drink at the back of the room. Please uh, be aware of your bags and every staff, even if we are uh, almost finishing the event. Eh, muchas gracias por venir. Recordaros uh, que el próximo será en Ciudad BVA. Hay una cosa logística importante que os decía antes. Va a ser un poco más temprano que este y está más lejos. O sea que cuando lo comunicaremos también un poco antes para que podáis apuntaros, el registro va a ser un poco más lento, pero nos gustaría que, que vinierais también ahí porque no, no creo que pase muchas veces más que hagamos un, un evento en, en, en Ciudad BVA y va a ser un evento muy especial. Eh, seguimos hablando al final. Muchas gracias por venir y os esperamos en octubre.